Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar today. This is Megan Chamis, and I lead marketing here at FIDO Alliance. Last June, the FIDO Alliance announced that we would be launching initiatives in two new work areas, IoT and identity verification. There's been a lot of interest for both of these initiatives, but today we're very happy to have this webinar to share this more information on the IDV and binding initiative. Today, we're pleased to have three speakers join us for the discussion. We have the co-chairs of the FIDO Alliance's new Identity Verification and Binding Working Group, Rob Carter, the Director of Product Development and Innovation at MasterCard, and Parker Crockford, the Director of Policy and Strategic Accounts with Unfido. Their talk will be preceded by Andrew Shikiar, who will be able to give some added context and background. This will be particularly useful for those that may be new to FIDO. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but please feel free to ask questions using the GoToWebinar client. We'll either address them midstream or we will address them at the end with a Q&A. We'll try to answer as many as we can, but if any are not answered, we, we can address them via follow-up email. We are recording the webinar and we will send the slides and the recording over to you at the end of the webinar, and we'll also post it on FidoAlliance.org. And lastly, you'll see a survey at the end of the webinar. Please do take a few minutes, moments, not minutes, don't worry, to fill this out as your feedback helps inform our webinar program and other communications materials that we provide to the industry. So with that, let me hand it off to Andrew, who will kick off the discussion with an introduction to FIDO. Thanks, Megan. Uh, it's great to be in the webinar, and it's also, you know, very good to see the the high turnout uh, we had today. Uh, we have a, a near record number of, uh, of registrants, um, which you know tells me that the alliance made a sage decision to take on uh, this new work around identity verification. So, as many of you may be newer to FIDO, I just want to spend a few minutes to give a couple highlights on our organization and our outputs. Uh, we're not going to get into detail on our specs today. Uh, but there's plenty of information on our website and from prior webinars, and I'd encourage you to uh, to find that. Um, but in addition to specifications, FIDO also has a certification program uh, that tests primarily for product conformance and interoperability, uh, and also market adoption programs that help establish best practices and market education for how to deploy FIDO authentication in, into a variety of uh, settings and regions. So that's what, what FIDO is. Um, looking at who we are, um, FIDO was founded in 2013, so we can go to the next slide, um, by just six companies. Um, back in 2013, they were, at that point, they were looking at two separate use cases, uh, both of which leveraged asymmetric public key cryptography. One use case was focused on biometric authentication on mobile devices, which was still a, you know, a rather new concept in 2013, and the other was focused on an unfishable second factor authentication using external security keys. Both of these believed in you know, a core tenet of authenticating users locally to their device and moving away from you know, centralized shared secrets. The slide you see here, this is our leadership, right? And so oftentimes when I talk about who's leading FIDO, I like to you know, ask people to think about, well, who needs to be sitting around the table to solve the password problem? And I think you know, if you came up with a list of companies, it'd probably look a lot like this. All right, so you have leaders in consumer electronics who create the platforms and devices that, you know, consumers use every single day, right? In the middle of this the slide, you see leaders in security and biometrics, right? Who have either, you know, a, a vast history of providing strong authentication solutions or emerging entrants who have new ideas about how to improve the way that users log on to services. And then last but not least, um, are the companies whose businesses depend on their ability to deliver high assurance services to billions of users on a daily basis worldwide. And these are, you know, these are the companies that you know, help really shape the use cases that the rest of the alliance then builds into specifications in our go-to-market programs. This is our board of directors. In addition to these companies, um, you know, this is around 42 companies. We have, you know, 250 members, uh, including sponsor members, associate members, and also liaison partners who are other associations and nonprofits and regional groups that help define joint use cases. Um, and go to market programs um, in, in different verticals and markets. So, you know, the, the landscape that FIDO approached at founding you know, featured two primary mechanisms for user authentication. 
And, and you can see those you know, marked out here on, on, the, on the matrix. On the bottom, you see passwords, right? And that's a well entrenched way of authenticating users that um, has very weak security and also you know, pretty poor usability, right? I think as consumers, we can all understand the challenge of trying to remember passwords or keep up with password policies. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if your password is a password or an advanced catchphrase or passphrase. If it's sitting on a server, it's at risk for being stolen um, reused and, and stuffed into, into other accounts. The other uh, approach to authentication, which is you know, more um, has been around for a long time, also is, is OTPs, you know, so one-time passcodes, whether delivered to a dedicated hardware token um, or to a phone. That certainly is an improvement over a single factor uh, password, but it presents its own set of challenges, right? So it has you know even worse usability than than passwords. In fact, it's introducing a second password. But perhaps most important, you know, OTPs also um, can be hacked, right? So there's still a shared secret. It's still a, a, a server-side shared secret, albeit for a shorter period of time, <clears throat> but it can be hacked. It can be spoofed through social engineering or through SS, SS7 attacks, which can still lead to account takeovers and things like that. So where FIDO is focused is on delivering you know, simpler, stronger authentication, you know, finding the sweet spot in this matrix um, to deliver better use, uh, better authentication experiences for users, but also a safer, less risky best practice for service providers to deploy um, authentication that leverages public key cryptography, allows users to use the devices that are in their hands every day um, in a way that you know, both protects the users and also enables them to you know, more seamlessly consume online services. So, you know, FIDO had this very narrow focus on, on user authentication at the outset, and, and we released specifications against that, right? So we, we uh, quite quickly in 2014, 2015, we had our first set of specs for biometric and second factor authentication. And more recently, we released a FIDO2 set of specifications, which includes the WebAuthn uh, work from W3C, as well as the CTAF work from FIDO Alliance. Both two of those things comprise FIDO2. Um, you know, these standards have been productized, um, have been built into platforms, so they're built into all Android 7 handsets and later, and Windows 10 machines, that's for FIDO2. Um, and the full set of specifications have been utilized by leading service providers around the world, for, you know, ranging from Google to Facebook to Twitter to Visa, MasterCard, T-Mobile, um, and many more um, who have you know, validated and found that FIDO's approach to strong user authentication you know, protects their users and presents an unfishable um, approach to authentication that prevents account takeovers and other nefarious actions. So while that approach to authentication has been validated in the market, um, FIDO stakeholders identified some adjacent areas where there are some weaknesses that need to be addressed, right? So um, you know, hackers aren't, they don't quit, they're not lazy, they'll, you know, if, if they find a, a hardened area, as is the case with FIDO authentication, they'll look to weak, weak spots adjacent. And those two areas, as Megan mentioned, uh, as we announced back in June, one is IoT, all right? So we're looking to automate secure device onboarding to take the password out of IoT. And the other area, which we're here to talk about today, is identity verification and binding. So with that, I wanna turn things over to the experts. Um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Rob Carter initially, and then Parker will, will speak as well to talk about FIDO's work in identity verification and binding. Rob. All right, thanks, Andrew. Uh, slide to the next slide. There we go. So before we get into identity verification, the problems and, and kind of and FIDO's approach where we're going with this, just wanted to pause and take a second to discuss who's involved. And this this is a, who's involved specifically in the ID verification working group that we're working on, as opposed to, to FIDO uh, more broadly. Um, we've got 84 members and, and growing. Actually, Parker and I had a call with, with another uh, another company that's uh, interested in joining today. Um, and they're really from a, a good mix of companies that sit in different places in the ecosystem. Uh, we've got service providers that are involved with Aetna, uh, MasterCard, uh, where I work, as well as Amex and Visa, a number of large banks. Um, we've got tech providers. We've got providers like Adfido, Ubico, Vimeo, ID Now. Uh, we've got companies that sit kind of on both sides of that, your Googles or Microsofts, and even government involvement. The UK government um, has been involved uh, with this group as well. Um, on a personal note, or actually I should say on MasterCard's behalf, I can say um, the reason that we're involved in this, we've been involved with FIDO for many years, 
and um, been a big supporter of, of the authentication standards that FAD has been putting together. Um, at the same time, we've been dealing uh, with the identity verification uh, issues as a relying party. We've spent a lot of time exploring different market options, and uh, we believe there's benefit for standardization in this space. Parker, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, uh, Unfido has been, you know, joined the the, the Fido Alliance and and the board back in uh, December of of last year. And you know, the real the reason we've done that really is a couple fold. One is, you know, we're we're being pulled into more authenticated uh, authentication uh, use cases. Um, and and two, a lot of the work that you know a lot of companies like ourselves do around digital identity, um, either with regulators or governments um, and alike, is the the question of sort of how uh, have you been tested in a third party way that is clear and consistent um, and that the industry is, has buy into and the answer for that has always been has always been no and so the we believe with strong verification we need to be able to to point to um, a robust way to um, to to prove any level of service if it's a provider like us and Unfido or even um, the when relying parties have built their own in-house solutions to be able to meet the right market standards. And so that's why we joined the board and we drove the, the study group and um, at the board level and then was able to get, have approval and, and launch it um, back in, in, in the summer. So we're, we're excited with the level of participation we have and our ability to, to drive our, our industry forward. Okay, that's great. So then the question really becomes, all right, so FIDO, why FIDO? Now, over the years, they've done a great job of creating standards around device-based and biometrics-based authentication with a strong focus on security as well as user experience, as, uh, as Andrew was discussing before. Um, but what happens if I lose my FIDO authenticator? Uh, what happens if I uh, destroy a phone or get a new phone? I have to recover my account. and. Um, and that account recovery process is really critical to maintaining the integrity of the user's account. This can be a vulnerable attack vector, or attack vector rather. Um, FIDO authentication is very secure, but if I can get around that by uh, guessing your mother's maiden name as part of an account recovery process, then we've still got a problem. So um, this has not been lost on the Alliance. We've published a white paper uh, that makes recommendations as to what to do for account recovery. Um, and in a perfect world, ideally, the user will register multiple authenticators. So I'll, uh, for instance, if I'm using uh, FIDO login uh, with my bank's app, uh, I will do so both on my mobile phone as well as, uh, as a tablet that I have. That way, if I lose one and need to replace it, I can use the other device to log in securely and add uh, add back in uh, the new device that's been replaced. But that's not always feasible. Um, sometimes the users, the end users, won't have two devices, or or uh, or maybe they do, but they haven't uh, registered FIDO authenticators on uh, on uh, both of those devices. So in those cases, we recommend that we rerun that the service providers rerun the onboarding uh, identity proofing process, not falling back on passwords. Um, but using whatever mechanisms were used to, to onboard uh, in the first place. Passwords obviously are easily fished and, uh, and nobody remembers them. Now the concern there is many will, of the service providers will rely on knowledge-based authentication for the account recovery or, or the original uh, onboarding to begin with. And um, so when I say knowledge-based authentication, KBA, for instance, you'll get questions like what street did you grow up on or which bank has your mortgage? Um, but KBA has its own issues that uh, Parker will get into now. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, and so the, the the piece that we're seeing in the market really cut sort of of, of two ways. And I think the, the first piece um, comes down to, you know, your, this, and you can see some of the, the stats here of, of what came out from a Google survey um, that it's most users are incredibly uh, sophisticated of how they set up their um, their their whole process as as Rob mentioned um, and and two it's easy to find what you need um, in 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 the in the in the 
dark web or just from phishing directly um, on a from an email piece. And so one of the conversations we have with our banking partners um, around sort of their digital verification workflows is, you know, uh, about how how do they position around sort of a KB, KBA when it comes to their risk scoring and more times than not, the our financial services partners say that if you answer all five of the KBA questions correctly, or you answer them too quickly, um, you actually put in put yourself into a higher fraud bucket um, because this piece is something that is uh, where where most most people don't remember everything they need to. Um, and then if you put out there when it comes to the data breaches, a lot of things that gets um, a lot of press, and especially after um, when when you know, you have credit card information in or SSNs that have been um, released into the market, um, you know, that can affect you, but those are short-term sort of resources um, that can be um, burnt up once, uh, you know, someone's realized either their identity has been stolen or, you know, the, the fraud engines around the payments have, have, have realized a credit card number has been stolen. The, the challenge with what's now being breached more frequently is that you that uh, account uh, name and password. Um, but a, a fraudster can point that at a system and do account stuffing, and but they haven't burnt those resources. That that they can take that um, that database of of account you know uh, usernames and passwords and just in, direct it to a new uh, a new platform and and start going through that to see see how they're successful. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, and so what we're, we're we're targeting here and what we're looking for when it comes to high this higher surge uh, assurance is it really has come down to you know this piece of being able to uh, capture a, a government ID and uh, you know government ID has the the advantage that especially with the Real ID Act that's coming that came out here in the U.S. Um, uh, at some point in time, you were you were proofed, or you were someone physically saw you to to see um, where you were with that that driver's license. Um, but and also there is there is an active uh, biometric on um, that device for you and uh, on that card for you. So it, it helps to it helps to pin that 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 digital footprint or that person who owns that account to actually that person where we see it. And so this is the reason we focus in on this. Um, really comes down to sort of the gap analysis that we, we looked at uh, uh, in the rest of the market when it came to how to create a high level of assurance when you're when you're doing this verification and not just being dependent on um, databases um, or attributes. Um, and so the reason, uh, if we can go to the next slide, when it comes to the, the gap analysis that we went through in the market, it really came down to one of the, the biggest problems that, you know, with with identity, uh, especially in the remote setting, like we're talking about here, is it's a it's a global problem, but it's it's solved locally um, in a lot of different um, uh, instances, and also um, every country has has sort of a different flavor. And so when we really looked into the market to say, is there a role for for Fido Alliance to play? Is there something that we can go do? We, we broke it down to really look at sort of the government programs and first the standard bodies that sit around um, a lot of this. And the, the government programs uh, are, are there to sort of set the frameworks and, and you know, you're seeing this as a trend of more um, government uh, databases are opening themselves up to be able to, uh, to, to get those attributes directly from, from the government source. So, um, you know, obviously, you have the Pan Canadian Trust framework. Uh, you have the work of what the UK government, uh, government is doing. You have uh, IDA, uh, sorry, EIDAS in, in Europe, and and they're really setting the framework sat around that, um, along with the standard groups are setting the the frameworks um, uh, around identity uh, assurance um, and the process and what you should do and how you should go do it. But really, the the process that was let's say missing is in you know, we, we've all had that experience of trying to capture a government ID and, 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 and validating it at scale in a remote setting is it never actually tested the, the, how well these, these platforms worked. And again, it's not only the identity wallets in the, in the market, it's not only the providers like ourselves, it's also the, the relying parties who have built these, these systems themselves to say if we really want these this interoperability to come into the market, our ability to to work with current you know uh, FIDO credentials and the biometric uh, ongoing authentication, 
we had to we had we we saw that there's a way to go and focus in on being able to to standardize these 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 areas of the of um, of the industry. Um, and so with, with that, it really kind of then breaks down into what the working group is doing. And, and I'll, I'll hand this over to, to Rob. Thanks, Parker. So after all that work, all that gap styles, gap analysis, um, uh, we just, you know, this, this is what we came up with. We, we started with the, with the kind of grounding uh, premise that Fido promotes remote identity proofing through possession, much like authentication uh, has always been through possession, um, layering in biometrics as well. But heading back to uh, identity proofing, the last item there could be a government ID, could be a device, um, any number of things. Um, regardless, there's no criteria that exists right now for determining what's good enough um, when you're trying to verify any of these possessed, el possessed elements uh, during remote, remote identity proof proofing. And the and that result of that is that relying parties are left to their own devices to establish their own acceptance criteria and performing bake-offs across different different vendors. This testing is time-consuming and expensive. Um, I can tell just from work we've done at Mastercard, uh, it's uh, it's it's quite resource-intensive and, and and not realistic uh, to expect for every relying party or every service provider um, that's out there. And then also uh, what we've learned as part of, of the research we've been doing in this group is that the testing that relying parties do is frequently not representative of real world fraud vectors, or at least not at the right scales. We may be over-focused on uh, testing fake IDs where uh, Photoshopped images wind up being 95% of, uh, of the fraud, depending on the use case, for instance. So as a result, to address these gaps, uh, we formed the Identity Verification and Binding uh, Working Group. And the mission that we have is to provide authoritative guidance and uh, solution certification programs um, around possession-based identity verification procedures. Um, so that includes government-issued identity documents, driver's license, national IDs, passports, what have you, uh, but is not limited to those as well. Um, we could also be looking at device verification and, and other market uh, approaches um, in different markets as we move forward. So in, uh, in order to advance this mission, the activities that, uh, that we're going to be engaged in, we'll, um, what we're working on right now is defining criteria for solution performance. Um, we're creating and deploying a program to support the adoption of that criteria. So for anyone out there who's familiar with uh, FIDO biometric certification, very similar, we're using that as a model um, uh, to develop our test requirements, lab procedures, and what have you. And we're actually working with the existing FIDO certifications working groups uh, to, to make sure that we're doing that in line um, with uh, kind of existing FIDO, uh, FIDO norms. And we'll also be producing thought leadership white papers to promote the utilization, market awareness uh, of this new program. Great. And so with, with what we're really looking at uh, for, for not only the, the document piece and what, we, what we're hoping to, to go forward um, in the future is really looking at, if we look at this, this life cycle of sort of where you are with your your ID uh, proofing, your identity proofing. We we wanted to focus in on the pieces that were um, mainly focused for uh, remote. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, for remote um, services. Um, so that's coming down to the document capture, the document authentication when it comes to the different fraud vector security features, your ability to to capture and uh, classify the document, and capture what what uh, sides of um, on fraud, and then it really comes into that sort of where you are with the, the photo evidence, but not only with the, the capture of the government ID, but then looking at how you do the facial similarity, the face matching um, to that to the biometric off the government ID, um, to the uh, to the selfie or a live video or something along those lines, and and really what we're going to come to here at, at the end of this of this process is. The ability to to either create uh, a credential or, more importantly, 
look at how we bind to uh, to a FIDA2 credential or um, something else within uh, within the in the uh, in the market to be able to to really get something that's not only robust robust of the the verification process so that we can we can really get to a a much more convenient and more secure experience within within the market um, but that users and uh, relying parties and governments and everyone can actually get uh, feel comfortable that the the providers that are verifying or creating these types of possible credentials meet the right standards in the market um, to, to be accepted um, and so if we go down to, to the to the side here really what we're, we're looking at sort of for our priorities in, in, in long term is as as uh, Rob mentioned here is we're really currently uh, driving and focusing on uh, the criteria for what that identity document verification is and so that's writing up the the specs um, to say this is what and how um, it should be tested um, which then allows us to go and and work with the the different other working groups within Fido um, and the, the 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 testing labs that already exist um, with relationships of, of how do you go implement that in the wild um, and then really what then that that allows us and, I, and you know we've mentioned previously allows us to move into these next phases over the course of the next you know uh, six nine twelve eighteen months is then look at how do we again, create that that same testing sort of uh, piece when it comes to the, the matching the document to a live video or face and then when it comes to the binding and I think that the binding piece is you know when we have the possibility and we're working with with the FIDO board and, and aiming to be um, making sure we're going in the, in, in the direction that the alliance wants uh, to be able to think about how do we do that that binding to authenticators um, that only helps with account creation uh, helps with preventing of account takeover but also you know that key sort of step of account recovery as well um, so that you know that I am Parker Crackford and and this authenticator that I've lost belongs to me and it can be reinstated to give a, a much higher level of assurance again in a remote setting um, so this will come down to the use cases and, and and what makes sense for everyone involved but I think the 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 work and where we're where we're focused at currently is this is is the the document verification piece first um, uh, and and what we what we're hoping to accomplish is this gets to, to allow everyone in the in the industry to provide a much more secure, robust, uh, and convenient experience for users, and and move forward with being able to remove our reliances on uh, passwords. So I'll hand it over to uh, to Andrew here before we get to Q and A. Thanks, guys. Um, so thanks, everybody, for uh, listening in to this. As, as Parker mentioned, we are going to move to, to Q&A in a second. Um, you know, just a little plug for, for getting involved with FIDO Alliance and the IDWG in, in particular. Um, you know, this is a new work area uh, for FIDO. And it was, it was a non-trivial decision um, when we decided to take on these new workspaces. And, and you know, what we've seen is a lot of interest in the marketplace and the industry, and, and we've seen some companies get involved to help shape exactly, um, you know, what this group is going to be doing, uh, shape the initial outputs um, around um, performance testing, and then also shaping the long-term vision um, and scope for this working group and for the alliance itself. So um, if you're interested in getting involved with this working group, you know, please do um, join FIDO Alliance. Um, at the sponsor level is, is required level to be able to take part in the working groups. The uh, next slide shows you some added resources um, about how to learn more about FIDO. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, we were talking about some background on the Alliance. Our website does have uh, a, a lot of information um, about the specifications, but also we have a resource center that has uh, case studies and different perspectives that might add value uh, to your organization as you contemplate how to move forward with a you know, modern authentication solution. So with that, uh, let's turn to Q&A. Um, first of all, I'm going to address the most popular question, which is, you know, will you get the slides and will this recording be sent to you? And the answer is yes to both. Um, we'll follow up um, over the next, you know, 24 to 36 hours with a link to the recording 
um, and the slides in SlideShare. So let me now move to some other questions. Um, so again, if you have questions, please ask them in the uh, through the software client, and then we will uh, do our best to address all of them, and anything we don't address, we'll try to handle offline. So I'm going to ask the first one to Rob. Uh, question here, how does FIDO relate to PSU2 compliance? Um, for example, if your authentication solution is PSU2 compliant, then is it FIDO compliant as well? If not, what's the gap? So just so I think you know, there's, well, one answer to that is that there's, there's a difference between being FIDO compliant and you're FIDO certified in PSU2, PSU2 compliance. But Rob, if you could share any thoughts on how FIDO fits with PS, PSU2 compliance, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, I mean, it's so oh, they're, they're related, but uh, I wouldn't say there's a one-to-one -one correlation between PSD2 compliance and FIDO compliance. I'll say that there are um, PSD2 compliant solutions that are FIDO based, um, and uh, and obviously we we think that uh, that is a, a strong approach uh, to take. But it, it's it's not as simple as to say there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, Parker, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, a lot of ID documents are not designed for remote usage. How do you then assess the, the reliability of the identity attribute extraction? And then actually, before you answer that, it's some, some related questions in the queue here about handling you know, diversity of different types of you know, government and regional identity documents around the world. I mean, how, you know, how might FIDA look at that and how, to, how do you know, vendors in this space look at that in general? Yeah, I mean, both of them are um, good questions, and uh, you know, one of the challenges of not only for for providers of of being able to to support the 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 breadth and depth of the documents, and then also being able to understand from uh, the security features on those documents what's readable in a uh, through a picture, and what can you can you actually um, you can actually do. And so, look the. The questions, and also there's other questions here of, of how you're going to do this with with all the different regions. And I think that that piece right now is is you know a, an open conversation within the working group of of how we de, of how we define that, um, because obviously a U.S. driver's license is incredibly uh, uh, different, and there's you know there's 50 states with three to four different versions as long as as well with the the real ID um, coming out. So. You know, do we focus in on creating sort of regional testing to say, look, here's North America, Europe, Africa, you know, um, Asia, and 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 LATAM. Um, but we we haven't uh, fully fleshed that that one out because we're still putting the 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 different um, uh, pieces around it. So I think it, it will when we get to the actual, how do we how does it get tested and what does that look like? You know, we're probably going to, you know, probably have Passport, which is a global standardized template, and then look at sort of where do we go there from from national ID cards to regions, um, and and how to figure that out because it, it is a a large robust problem, um, and to 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 be frank, now we're we're still looking to figure out how to how to do that at the in the in the best way for what meets the 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 right standards um, uh, across the different regions. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, I think Rob may want to address this at first, but if Parker, maybe either one of you guys jump in, please. A question about liveness detection. Um, you know, it's covered by existing certification requirements for authentication. Um, how do we look at liveness detection in the context of identity verification and on onboarding. Is this something that the working group is looking at now? Is this in scope for our current work? And um, if so, how's that being factored into the decisioning? So perhaps, that's, perhaps uh, yeah, that's part of the performance criteria. Yeah, sure. And the, the short answer is yes, um, is that we do consider it at the moment to be, to be within scope um, of that testing. Uh, we're still sorting out exactly how you know the different pieces of uh, you know, for document verification. There's there's obviously multiple pieces of this. There's the verification of the document itself. There's the 
There's the selfie matching. Um, when the user takes a selfie matching that against the document, the liveness detection is also a piece of that. Um, so uh, I guess the short answer, short answer is yes, it's all, it's all being uh, factored in. Yeah, and and I'll jump in here as well. I think the the piece where we we would probably lean on those current standards when it comes to the liveness piece and and not reinvent the wheel, which is something we're we're doing our best um, to do, is is more look at um, potentially def looking at the the, the face matching um, from the image off the government ID to obviously the uh, whatever that the video or the selfie is. Be which which we right now view is different than doing ongoing authentication through through just one picture to the next picture, um, mainly because the it's the systems have to be able, be built different and you're not going to have that sort of direct to one to one match um, because you shouldn't look like your um, your picture on your driver's license. The background should be different. You should have aged in some framework depending on when you had it taken. And there's a whole lot of different sort of variables that come in. Um, so that that you know the far you know the the false acceptance and false rejection rates and the different pieces are are uh, in speed would will be different than an authentication use case. So I think we'll we'll pick uh, we're hopefully leaning on a lot of the other work and we're dependent on a lot of the other uh, um, sort of pieces in the market. Okay, thanks. Um, so we also have a couple of questions about FIDO vis a vis. Um, so our, our emerging work here vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other um, kind of identity verification frameworks. So specifically, you know, how does FIDO um, relate to work coming out of Kantara, also out of NIST? Uh, does this relate to the 863-3 guidelines? Um, any added insights? I know you covered some of this in the gap assessment up front, but any added thoughts on, on how we're looking at this would be would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I can jump in there first and say, look, the, the what we're focused on is the that document capture side of the of the conversation and how that actually performs. Um, not looking at reinventing the wheel for what NIST has done and obviously the work Kantar is doing um, to to say, are you compliant in those frameworks? And say, look, there's there is those are you know they're there and there there are standards that you can map to, but in Nowhere in those standards does it talk about um, what does what does good look like from um, actually from a performance base and um, and so the thing we want to get away from is saying like well I'm I'm you know NIST compliant um, but then your performance actually in the market may not be um, suitable for some of the use cases and the different pieces that we're looking for so we're we're addressing that problem and not trying to to reinvent or create um, uh, other standards outside the ones that are already built there. So that's why we're focused on performance and, and leaving these other standards to, to do the work and, and point to them in, in the reference piece. Okay. Um, so Rob, this would be good one for you. Um, you know, what's, what's the expectation of how companies will leverage you know, this group's outputs? You know, how would a relying party benefit from what the what the identity, identity verification and binding working group is doing, um, I think the uh, the biggest way that, that we're that we're trying to provide benefit to the to the service providers is um, making some concrete recommendations around identity proofing and the different uh, different processes you can do as part of that, and um, shedding some light on the performance. Uh, for the for the for the different criteria that actually matter um, across the uh, across the vendors, or I shouldn't even say comparing the vendors, but, but providing some um, providing acceptance criteria of you know, that, that definition of uh, of what's good enough um, for for these purposes, because I think that's really missing right now from uh, from this point of market. Yeah, and I I know you know put in there when it, what they you know possibly they'll be able to. To look at is you know a lot of relying parties um, have actual problems of um, testing in a very let's say robust and uh, way for for a couple of reasons one they you know with especially with privacy and security pieces coming through do they have the 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 government IDs to actually test with um, are they able to create the uh, sophisticated fake or not sophisticated enough fake and 
and there's not, you know, any one level of, you know, I'm sure of any provider that's gone through um, a bake off, you know, every single one of those is different. Um, and it's, it's at times hard to, to see what is, what is actually, what are you testing for the right pieces for what you'll see um, in, in a live environment. So it should help, you know, streamline some of those pieces um, and, and also take sort of that, that burden of trying to get the right privacy framework and spending the time resources um, to be able to say like, well, at least we know who is, who's matching the, this, these public um, uh, certification of, of testing. So I think it will, it will streamline that process, save the relying parties um, time and money um, and, and also uh, enable for, for a, a more straightforward uh, performance um, uh, testing. Okay. Um, a question about how we're doing this proofing. Um, so the remote verification, is, is it being you know, done in the cloud or on device, right? So, so you know, and then I guess, you know, the, the real question here, you know, and we get this fair amount is, you know, if FIDO's you know, very much about possession based on device authentication, um, how do we mesh that with the requirement to, to do, you know, process perhaps a photo in the cloud? You know, have, is the, is the working, how's the working group meshing these two things together? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, um, and I think this is for you know within the FIDO uh, universe. This is you know this process is not going to be happening. You know, the verification of the government ID is not going to be happening um, on device. There's there's things that can be put on device um, when it comes to maybe when it comes to classification and performance of the capture and some of these other pieces. Um, but the one of the you know the differences all providers are, you know, cloud-based and even if it's on-prem or, um, you know, it's it, the, these images will be leaving the device. Um, and so we're working with uh, the, the security and privacy working group of, of FIDO um, and trying to set that, that, that understanding and framework as part of the, the Kantara and other processes to make sure that when that device, when that image leaves the device, it's, it's being handled in a, in a secure Privacy centric way, um, and that the data is being respected for it being used for those, the purpose of, of those testing. So I think it's it's going to be some work that we're going to have to do as we move forward with with the working group because this will be the the first time FIDO has done something that doesn't isn't directly um, on device. Okay, uh, we have a few questions about. Um... Youth, you know, managing, um, you know, youth, youth in a couple of ways. One about you know protecting uh, children's privacy, but also you know, people who don't have identity documents. Um, so, is this something that the working groups looking at? How, how do you know, do remote onboarding for someone who does not have documentation, either due to age or due to um, maybe they're coming from you know the they're migrant like that, where they don't necessarily have uh, identity identity government issued documentation. Uh, sure, I can I can start uh, on that one. The, the the way we're really approaching approaching this is we are trying to put uh, acceptance criteria and test programs around solutions that exist in the market. So um, whereas uh, so so document verification is a solution that exists in the market. We may be looking at device verification and other mechanisms as they come down the road. So where we're not driving specific solutions. Uh, we're not writing any specifications. Actually, we're not a we're not a technical working group or a uh, uh, a regular working group, <laughs> I suppose. Um, so you know, as solutions arise to be able to solve for those problems, uh, to the extent that it fits within the scope of work that we're doing, that maybe that maybe there's maybe solutions uh, that we can uh, that we can test, but we're not necessarily um, driving towards uh, things like that. Um, Parker, um, does the FIDO identity, ver FIDO identity Verification Initiative include verification against some sort of registry of known compromised identities in its scope? So is, is there, I mean, I guess this goes for either one of you, I suppose, but you know, is there a known, if there is a list of compromised identities, is, 
are we contemplating how to, to reference that? Um, or is that adjacent to the work that we're doing within the working group? Um, I think that's gonna it's gonna be a, a adjacent, and I think there's there's probably some really big uh, privacy um, concerns around that. Um, if we were to try to set something up like that, um, you know, uh, in, internally as an Unfido, you know, we have a a, a known you know a list of known documents in our platform that we know are fraudulent or can be found on the on on the web or a series of other pieces. But that's you know. Um, but to, to build sort of a third party public version of that, um, I'm sure lawyers would have um, a very hard time. And, you know, the the where sort of FIDO sits, I don't think that that would be, you know, the um, something we would the organization would want to go tackle. Um, and so the, I, I think we, the answer to that is no, just from from that privacy piece and, and just what what FIDO is hoping to accomplish here. Um, you know, setting up a, a database of, of known um, uh, identities that are that are uh, yeah, it just sounds like a, it could it could unravel quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of pouring through the questions. So we have several questions um, off topic that we're not going to answer. I'd, I'd encourage you to go to the website if you have questions about FIDO2. Visit the website. Um, IOT, we have questions on that. Um, we will have a, a future webinar on the IOT work. Um, you can also leverage any of the email addresses that you could, uh, that were in this presentation, such as info at phytoalliance.org, if you send an email there. Uh, we do answer those, so please, if you have general questions um, about specs or anything, please message us there, and we'll do our best to answer those. What? Um, as we're looking at the performance criteria, what, what, what is the level of security that is targeted? Um, is it face-to-face -face equivalence? You know, how, how will that be measured? Um, do we have any thoughts on that yet? So Parker, maybe for you, so is, I mean, is, there, is there an equivalence you can make about the level of security that we're looking to verify, the le level of verification? Yeah, um, I mean, level. Look, I think it comes down to this. Goes back to one of the first questions that was asked, and um, and I think it's an open conversation of currently for the working group. It's the, you know, it's the type of document, um, and from that type of document, what types of security features can be can be seen from from a picture, um, uh, and then, you know, just the coming down to you know some of the standards already in the market about you know. Uh, how do you, when it comes to the capture, there's already some pieces there of, of you know, having a video uh, capture of the government ID, um, and then there's, the, it comes around to the liveness. So I think it's a good question, and I think it's an open one um, that we're, we're looking at from as we create the, the standards and, and continue this sort of dialogue with the overall market. Okay. Bear with me as I'm going through a couple of remaining questions. Um, here's one. How will consumers and user of FIDO credentials know when a FIDO credential has gone through identity proofing and binding? So this is not something that would be uh, visible to the consumer, um, correct? And this is meant to be something behind the scenes. That's uh, right. I, this I mean, would be... Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would say that the binding would be be behind the scenes, but obviously they, they would have to provide their government ID and, and biometric to on either the, the bootstrapping of the, the identity and or on the recovery. Um, but I'm I'm sure if as this as these roll out, there you know there will be some sort of marketing and uh, positioning to allow the user to you know say this is the level of, of assurance for. That, that we as a relying par party have reached um, to create this user experience for you. Okay. Um, will the output of the validation uh, be binary or will it be gradient? Um, so as, as we're assessing a performance, is it, is it a you know, black and white or is it um, you know, a, a score. Do we have a feel for that direction yet? Uh, so that's actually, that's uh, one of the open questions 
is that uh, uh, is in the document, um, some of the documents that we're working on right now. Uh, so I think at a high level, though, uh, it's a, the thing to point out is that we're not being prescriptive. We're not creating specific or sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, specifications defining you know protocols or, or response types for these. So um, what we're defining is acceptance criteria. So um, the way to think about it, the way I, the way I see it likely evolving is that um, in order to meet a certain acceptance criteria with one vendor, there may be a certain score that's hit, another vendor hits that with a binary. Um, but Parker, maybe you can uh, add to that. Yeah, no, I think I think we'll when we start to create the you know there's we'll start to create the level of 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 the documents to say look this is you know, a picture of a Mickey Mouse, you know, um, there you that any any provider should catch. And then I believe there'll, there'll be sort of a gradient going up to levels of sophistication of fraud that you're um, that you're able to catch. Um, but again, these are these are being defined and hashed out and we'll probably um, have a lot of, of, of conversations around um, in, in the working group over the, over the next weeks, months um, coming up. Okay. Um, there's questions around EIDAS and you know, some of the different initiatives in, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, can either one of you kind of touch on this or, I know it, or, or recap what was covered already about how this identity verification work may relate to uh, EIDAS? Yeah, so I mean, again, I think this comes back to to sort of the same comments we're having having previously. Like, um, you know, we're focused on the performance of the the document capture right now. Um, that digital proofing side of EIS DAS isn't isn't um, a, a core component, um, and we're hoping that it, it this will help enable programs like um, in EIS DAS and uh, other private ones and, and other geographies when it comes to identity wallets. Um, but it's it's to help enable or drive um, some of those you know, to to make them more robust and or um, you know drive drive some of these conversations forward. Okay. Um, so Parker, I know you talked about real ID a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> question about you know digital driver's licenses and digital government issued IDs. You know, how how might we interface with those? Um, would that help with you know a higher you know with identity verification, you know, granting someone a, a higher you know uh, assurance level, if you will, or a higher um, score? Or does that have or would that have any impact on, on how we assess um, digital credentials versus physical credentials? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the, the piece that we're focused on is obviously, you know, the majority of what um, everyone around the world has is still a, a physical copy of a government ID and, that, and I don't see that um, going away. Um, obviously, as with Oklahoma and uh, Virginia has some issues here, Illinois, um, um, and 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 several other states are driving towards a a more digital uh, first piece where that ID is being um, instantiated in in on the phone and and I think those are you know where this is going and and the possible pieces there you know there's still the 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 there's still the piece of 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 how does that how does that get passed around and verified which I think is out of scope in in this conversation. Um, but um, I think it's it's a space that we're looking at and watching, and and I think it's as this overall market matures, it's gonna, you know, they, it, it could be brought into that binding side um, of of when that ID is is created and and create um, sort of a FIDA two positioning and and enable again users to to be able to con control and share their their identity um, in remote settings. Um, and so as more states come out or as more countries come out with these pieces, I think it's, it's still going to be, um, you know, it's, uh, there's going to be, you know, we want to give the users as, you know, as, as many viable options as they can to be in control of their information, and their identity and the stuff happening at the state level with the DMVs and everything else is, 
Um, it's going to take time to mature and be there, but it's it's uh, I think it will impact obviously where the where the working group goes um, in the future when it comes, I think, especially to the binding side of the conversation. OK. Good. Well, listen, we're, we're towards the end of our hour, um, you know, so this working group is just getting started. Um, we have some questions on timelines and such. So those those are you know being evolved and as the timelines um, are finalized, you know, we will you know communicate in a public manner um, to our community, you know, by you know through uh, public disclosures, blog, and 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 email. So if you're not part of the, if you're not signed up yet um, on the FIDO email list, I'd encourage you to do so to, to get timely updates. Um, from this working group and from FIDO in general. Again, if you're interested in getting involved with this working group, you know, please consider joining FIDO as a member. Um, you can visit our website for how to do that or send an email to info at FIDOalliance.org. Um, before we wrap, let me just ask one last question to, to Rob and then Parker. Um, do you have any last impressions or takeaways or things to tell our audience today um, about this working group and you know your perspectives therein? Um, I guess the the key thing that I've really been benefiting from is getting perspective from not only uh, the docu or sorry the uh, technology providers but also the relying parties and just it's we've been learning a lot from each other about um, about the market about uh, and about kind of and opportunities we have to uh, to solve problems um, for the service providers here so that's that's really been the the, the most interesting thing here for me and, and I think we're on a on a good path to be able to create something of real value here. Super. Parker, any closing thoughts from you? Um, we need all the help we can get. Um, and so, you know, more people that can can join and partake and and make this a uh, an industry love initiative, um, the, the better I think it will be for for you know, not only the railing parties, but the the providers like Amfido um, to 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 bring these standards out. Um, it will help with conversations with government and regulators and, and a lot of the work we all want to be going and doing um, for, for, for the end users. Um, and not only it will, it will help us uh, make a more secure you know, place uh, uh, to be able to engage with services online. So please get involved and reach out if you have questions and we're, we're more, more than happy to engage and, and, and take any feedback um, from, from the overall community. Thank you. Super. Thanks Absolutely. so much. Second there. Okay, good. Well, th thank you both. And thank you, Megan. Thank you all for attending today. Um, again, if you have more questions, if we didn't answer your questions, or if you have more questions, send us an email, info at phytoalliance.org. Uh, last but not least, please do take a few minutes to sur fill, up, fill up the survey. It's a quick survey, but we'd like your feedback on both this webinar and also on future topics moving forward. So thank you all for attending. We look forward to seeing you on a future FIDO webinar.